external actors have been spent a lot of time debating over the future of Syria and what that should look like. However, these external actors rarely take into account the actual desires and wishes of the Syrian people, as has already been reiterated. Um, so I'd like to introduce to you, with that in mind, another proud Syrian and activist who has been um, organising around this issue for many years who can give you more insight. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Jasmine Sadat. I would like to begin by warning you that parts of this presentation may be quite graphic and I make no apologies in advance. Why? Because today I'd like to speak to you from a real Syrian perspective, a perspective that has been silenced in Western media and disregarded often in the international political arena. This is the perspective that is hardly ever depicted in mainstream media, the truth that has been hidden and distorted to make you believe in lies. And in order to do so, I need to bear witness and testify to some of the atrocities and horrors that the Syrian people have been living through over the past five years. I'm sure you have heard of plenty, but today I will share the many untold stories that must be heard despite how confronting they may be or how uncomfortable they may make you feel. I became an activist five years ago. People often ask me why. They ask me how much do you think you can achieve as one person or as a group of eight people leafleting and holding the occasional seminar and rally. To me, it is much more than that. To me, I feel so close to the issue. My father is Syrian. My brother was born in Homs. And I have a lot of family and friends that still live there today. And some have tragically died as a direct result of this war. I could not sit by quietly and watch while my father's homeland was destroyed. And I couldn't watch the widespread lies in the media and the whole nation suffer. A country I would be living in today if my father hadn't migrated to Australia 30 years ago. I feel it is my duty to speak out on behalf of all those Syrians who can't. To educate as many people as I can about the conflict in the hopes that they will see the truth and educate others too. There are two wars being waged on Syria. The war on the ground and the war on information. Let's begin by dispelling the myth that Syria is... Syrian conflict is a civil war. This is a lie, and many Syrians get upset to hear it referred to as so. The truth is that a proxy war is being waged against Syria as Western-backed foreign insurgents from over 83 nations continue to flow into Syria in their thousands, wreaking havoc and destruction everywhere. They are funded and armed by Saudi Arabia and Qatar, trained in Turkish military camps near the Syrian border, and their injured are treated in Israeli hospitals. They bring with them their twisted sectarian ideologies from the Wahhabi and Salafi school of thought, believing anyone that is not of their faith is a kafar, meaning a sinner or an infidel, and that crime is punishable by death. The issues surrounding political change in Syria are multifaceted and much more intricate than the, what is being reported in Western media. Yet the conflict Yet the conflict is being painted in simplistic black and white terms as a battle between a dictator who brutalizes his people and the so-called Free Syrian Army, which is supposed to represent the aspirations and future freedoms of the Syrian people. So let's discuss some of these so-called freedoms that Western governments, including our very own, have been supporting since day one of this conflict. The FSA are terrorists, plain and simple. That description is not reserved solely for infamous Islamic groups such as ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra and Al-Qaeda. Undeniable and mounting evidence over the past few years have clearly underlined the direct unity between these ex extremist Islamic groups and the FSA. The latter commonly portrayed by mainstream media as a moderate and representative organisation separated from, separated from radical extremists 
and this couldn't be further from the truth. The, FS, the FSA and their affiliated extremist groups have been terrorizing Syrian civilians since the very first day of this war. They have systematically targeted and destroyed the country's infrastructure, including its gas pipelines and electricity table, towers in an effort to destabilize the country, meaning many Syrians spend hours every single day without these basic commodities, making everyday life very difficult. The FSA, according to Western media outlets and the US government, are supposed to be progressive and revolutionary. Correct me if I'm wrong, but a revolution is meant to be a popular uprising that constitutes a change for the better. I ask you, how is the FSA suicide bombing more than two-thirds of serious hospitals, health centers, pharmaceutical centers, and ambulances, while full of staff and patients, revolutionary? How is that helping the people? How is destroying over 3,500 schools and universities across the country going to help build the country and encourage education, progressive thinking, and future generational leaders? Is this democratic freedom? That's the FSA's advice. Um, I warn you, this is a little bit graphic. Um, this is just some of the atrocities that have been committed in Syria. <laughs> On the 1st of October 2014, terrorists from the FSA detonated a car bomb in the civilian suburb of Akraman Homs, just outside the entrance of Al Mahzoumiya Primary School. They waited until people had gathered to help the wounded before a suicide bomber ran out and then blew up another bomb. It's actually in this video, but I'm not going to keep playing it. Over 50 young, innocent Syrian children were killed from the primary school, along with their parents that were walking them to school whole families were wiped out. Yet the world remained silent. Nowhere was this tragedy broadcast in Western media. تفجير المشي الوطني أنا بدي أصبح حتى كان عسكريا للجيش الأسدي الله أكبر That's the fruit brigade blowing up the Homs hospital These are the rebels that <laughs> John Kerry, Obama, Ashton Carter and Hillary Clinton and their likes are continually talking about these are the same rebels who are nicknamed John McCain's army since he has visit, visited them and fought for their support in the US Congress for over four years. And that is what Syrians think of them. But make no doubt that these are the very same rebels who are aligned with Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Jabhat al-Nusra. And the majority of these rebels are not even Syrian. They come from countries such as Tunisia, Algeria, Yemen, Egypt, Saudi, Qatar, and many more, as well as a lot of Western countries like the UK, Australia, and the US. Terrorism has been allowed to breed. Because we have so-called Sheikh, well, Sheikh, like Adnan al-Harur and Mohammed al zurbi who have dominated the Qatari-owned news station Al Jazeera over the past five years, inciting hatred in the region on their own dedicated shows, openly calling for the genocide of minority groups in Syria because they are kuffar. They are responsible for encouraging jihad, a holy war on these sinners, and brainwash Muslims in the Middle East and around the world to believe it is their religious duty to go to Syria and overthrow the nationalist government and to declare an Islamic state. They spread hate messages like Christians to Beirut and Alawites to the grave. You've only to go on YouTube. Oh, whoops. Oh, okay. 
I've lost the video. You can ask me to do that. There was a video I was going to play, but again, as I mentioned on YouTube, you can actually see the these shapes um, declaring genocide on minority groups. So why has the Western media not condemned Al Jazeera for their part in this? Why have these so-called shapes been given such a dangerous platform to continue to encourage terrorism and open genocide? And why has the world remained silent? Why is the West supporting and aligning, aligning itself with Saudi Arabia, who are supposedly concerned with human rights issues, when A, they have the worst human rights record in the world, and B, they're the ones responsible for funding and arming this insurgency in the first place? The hypocrisy and irony is not lost on Syrians. Imagine how, imagine how the Syrians feel watching these shows, listening to this hate, knowing that these terrorists are coming for them, watching the destruction of their country, having their loved ones killed and their children's futures stolen. And the West openly supports and aids the very same terrorists that have ruined their lives. The internet is littered with these atrocities because the FSA and, and, their, and other militant groups take pride in these acts. They record and broadcast them, ensuring there's no mistake who's responsible for these heroic acts and these acts of martyrdom. They probably hope God watches YouTube so that they can be guaranteed their 90 virgins in paradise. And the so-called free world allowed this to happen. What was once considered a terrorist in the eyes of the West has become a freedom fighter on the plains of Syria. Instead of supporting Syrian people in their fight against terrorism, in their fight against terrorism, the so-called free world has done nothing but make the plight of the Syrian people more difficult by placing economic sanctions on, Syrian, on Syria, making food and medicine scarce. I visited Syria in December 2013 in the midst of the conflict and met Syrians from all over Syria. While I was there, I visited a town in Tums, in, in Tums and stayed with some friends. At night, we'd hear the rumble of the generators um, for those that were fortunate enough to actually own, own one. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone is fortunate enough to own a generator, uh, as they are scarce now. And if you, do, if you are lucky to find one on sale, it's too expensive to afford. Uh, we, we would spend hours every night sitting in the dark around candles, waiting for the light to turn back on so we could charge our phones or watch the news, all the while listening to the sounds of the not-so-distant bombing. It was a very humbling experience. The saddest part was when the Syrians did everything they could to make me comfortable and would repeatedly explain that it was never like this before the war. We always had electricity and never turned off as if they were embarrassed. And all I could think about after listening to so many of their stories was that I couldn't imagine how terrifying it was to sit in the dark, listening to the killings on the streets or waiting for that imminent attack for your door to be stormed down and for the terrorists to come charging in. And here they were actually apologizing to me for the lack of electricity. I'm happy to say that last year, uh, the Jabhat al-Nusra occupied territories in Homs were liberated by the Syrian army and thousands of Syrians returned to their homes for the first time in four years. Uh, although there are still the occasional suicide bombings and car bombs that often go off in Homs. Uh, a week after I left Homs, a car bomb went off at the end of the street where I was staying. I used to walk past there every single day. Um, it was spine-chilling and devastating when I heard about that. Now, often I speak with people who want to know more about Syria, and they're shocked when I, when I describe what it was like before the war. The truth is that there is a lot of ignorant people out there about Syria, and they only know what they see on mainstream media. I'm shocked by the amount of people that think that Syria is, is or has always been an Islamic state and that women wear hijabs. This couldn't be further from the truth. As Sam mentioned, Syria is a nationalist and secular state. People are free to practice any faith they like. It's common in Syria to see churches and mosques side by side, and if you're lucky enough, you get to hear the church bells go off at the same time as the Islamic call for prayer. And in Syria, people don't talk about their religion. It's considered taboo. Syrians identify as Syrians only. They have a great deal of national pride. So the fact that the free world has described this conflict uh, as a civil war fueled by sectarian, sectarianism is a very sore point for many Syrians. Syria is one of the most unique places on earth because of its religious diversity. Uh, women are free to live their lives in Syria and to, en and to enjoy their lives as they please. 
Women have always been highly educated. They dominate the number of seats in universities. Uh, they, ha they hold some of the highest positions in government and society, and they're free to dress however they please. In summer, you see women in bikinis on the beach, and at night, I saw women dressing, dressed up going to parties in skirts so short. I thought if they dropped something, how am I going to bend over? Um, you know, and women in Syria have a relatively long history of emancipation, and the country is one of the most more advanced in the Middle East in terms of women's rights. Women obtained the right to vote in 1948. If the rebels had their way in Syria, women will have their most basic of rights taken away from them and treated as mere objects. So-called sheikhs in Saudi Arabia and Qatar have been issuing fatwas, which are like religious degrees or, or Islamic laws, um, which the rebels have been enforcing in their occupied territories, uh, despite the fact that the majority of Muslims actually uh, consider a lot of these laws completely fabricated. Uh, women have been banned to sit in chairs publicly. Uh, apparently, if they do so, it might incite the arousal of males around them. Fancy that, Syria in which women can't sit on chairs. Non-Muslim non women and those belonging to, mini to minority groups um, can be used as sex slaves, including children. And where is the outrage? And yet the West and their regional allies continue to support this oppression. In Syria, the amount of women that have been kidnapped by rebels and forced into a life of degradation, rape and torture is countless. A friend in Syria was kidnapped in Homs uh, in a village called Bab Amar on her way from university. She was held hostage in a building there with around 50 other women. Uh, they were kidnapped uh, and they were subject, subjected to gang rape and humiliation. Uh, they were then stripped naked, gathered into a ute, and then driven through the villages in Homs, uh, and then made to walk, get out of the utes and walk through the streets, completely naked, um, paraded like animals while the rebels were slapping them and grabbing their genitals and calling them an assortment of insulting names. Women have been raped and mutilated and left in the streets to die. Is this the freedom that the West is trying to impose on Syrians? Is this the freedom that FSA is fighting for? Women have always been held in high esteem in Syria. It's ingrained in the very culture of Syrian people. They are the backbones of every family. While I was in Syria, I, intended, I attended an official presentation there that was in honor of women. And they were acknowledged as the backbones of the country. Uh, and the government acknowledged them as the backbones of the country and attributed to their many sacrifices and contributions to the war effort. I watched as an elderly woman that was seated next to me uh, went up on the stage. Uh, four of her sons had been killed and the official there was trying to kiss her hands and feet in respect that she didn't like him. Uh, to say it was humbling is an understatement. I was in awe of the many women that I met in Syria for their resilience and their unbreakable spirits despite the many horrors they faced. Um, so much more to say. I have to cut it down. Okay. Uh, in Homs, I met another young lady named Hala, um, and she described the horrors of the rebel insurgency that she faced uh, in her village. Uh, it got to a point where they couldn't handle living in the fear day to day, uh, you know, waiting until it was their turn. So, her and her mother donned scarves, and her brother grew a beard and shaved his mustache. And at the time, the road from Homs to Latakia was really dangerous, and it was littered with uh, rebels. And they decided out of desperation to make that two-and-a-half-hour journey. Hala told me that was the scariest time in her life. And when they got in the car, before her brother turned on the car, her mother stopped him and said to him, make sure the gun in the glove compartment is loaded. And he checked it, and it was. And then she made him swear on everything that if they were stopped on that highway, the first thing he would do was pull that gun and shoot his sister in the head before shooting his mother in the head. Imagine how bad it is to be captured by rebels that you would prefer death than to see women humiliated and raped and tortured. 
not long before I arrived in Syria as well, Adra, an industrial town in the outer skirts of Damascus, had been invaded by, by rebels as well. And what happened there was almost unspeakable. They locked workers in industrial fire ovens and cooked them alive. They threw children in boiling oil and they decapita decapitated the heads of the people in the streets and then hung them in trees to celebrate Christmas. The rest of the heads they played soccer with. And there's footage of this because they filmed it. Meanwhile, in government-occupied areas that I was visiting at the time, I saw the most beautiful Christmas trees I'd ever seen in my life, and not because they rivaled that of David Jones or Myers. They were actually quite simplistic. The top half of the trees were decorated with ornaments, and the bottom half of the trees had pictures of martyrs and loved ones on them, and that was everywhere in Syria. Um... Got to wrap this up. Okay. So just quickly, I just want to talk a bit about the Syrian army as well uh, and the National Defense Force. The Syrian army are considered heroes in Syria because they've been defending their homeland for the past five years. They've been defending it against terrorism. They've made Assad said the ultimate sacrifice to protect their homeland. If the majority of Syrians didn't support the National Army, then Syria wouldn't have lasted so long. Uh, and the, majority of Sunni, uh, the majority of Syrians are Sunni, and this is a fact. And the majority of key positions in government are held by Sunnis, and this is a fact. So Sunnis are actually very fairly um, represented despite Western lies that would have you believe the minority group in Syria uh, controls the country. And some of the most hardcore government loyalists I met in Syria were actually Sunni. Uh, the National Defense Force is made up of volunteer Syrians um, and they help rescue civilians in occupied areas and support the National Army. Uh, another thing history tells us that conscripts are pretty bad at putting down popular rebellions um, and we know now that what happened in Syria is not a revolution. So. Um, I saw for myself in Syria the way that the Syrian people were interacting with the army. They feed them, they give them water, they bless them, they bless their families. Um, people felt very protected and very safe. I know I felt safe when I was in government protected areas. And now just quickly, there's just there's a lot of photos here that I want to show you. These are people openly and freely supporting the government and the national army. These are the pictures that you never see. In 2014, we had presidential elections in Syria, and Bashar al-Assad won with an overwhelming majority and with a really high participation rate that actually rivals those of uh, the U.S. Better than the U.S. Much, oh, much better than the U.S., yes. Thank you, Jay. Um, Syrians, let's talk about Syrians' opinion. Uh, they support President Assad and they respect him for standing his ground and not allowing Syria to bow to Western dictation, for not allowing Syria to fall prey to Islamic extremist states, for protecting the minorities against genocide, for protecting the Syrians' right to self-determination and a free and safe society. And the elections spoke for themselves. Uh, unfortunately, in Australia, we were denied our right, our right to vote. Um, this is just the people... This is them voting. Okay, so this is in Beirut. These are the refugees, the Syrian refugees in Lebanon. There were hundreds of thousands of them. They stood in, in the heat. People were fainting. Firemen were hosing them down, but they poured in their hundreds of thousands to have their right to vote. Happily. Do these people look forced to you? These are Syrians inside of Syria celebrating. They celebrated for one week after the president was elected. You never saw any of this in the media. I've never seen us celebrate when Abbott was elected for a week. <laughs> I didn't see it when Obama was elected either. I've honestly never seen anything like it in my life. If you, if you see the videos on YouTube and the photos, people were literally doing the tazkia, the Syrian, national, like Syrian dance, line dance in the streets. They were partying. People were voting with their blood. 
not their blood for the president, but their right for self-determination. I have to wrap it up. <laughs> um, okay. I know Jay is going to talk about Russian intervention, but I will just say quickly, Rus uh, Syrians love Russians. They love Putin. His name in Syria is Abu Ali. It's an affectionate nickname that they've given to him. And they chant it in the streets. They welcome Russia. Russia was welcomed into Syria. It was, it was legal. The intervention in Syria is legal just, uh, in contradiction to the US and NATO. And what Russia has achieved in such a short period of time is what the US and NATO couldn't do in like 18 months. So I guess uh, another thing as well is that Syrians want the US and their Middle Eastern allies held accountable for the war crimes that they've committed. They want the Turkish government held responsible for training camps that they've had and for not closing their border off to these terrorists. I'll finish on this. In contrary to the depictions of Western reports, this conflict has actually united Syrians uh, united so many Syrians, not only in Syria but around the world. And as we stand together as one in an effort to have our voices heard and to fight against the propaganda war uh, of the West. And this conflict has actually gained the President even more uh, support and respect than he had previously. So many Syrians living in Syria have told me if they could have one wish, it would be to have the old Syria back. I heard this everywhere in Syria. The Syria that was a paradise and a safe haven before the conflict erupted. And despite all that has happened, Syrians maintain an indomitable spirit that is truly awe-inspiring, and they continue to carry the flame of hope and unshakable determination that Syria will return to the greatness that it once was. And it will because justice will eventually prevail. In the words of the President, Syria was and will always be free, sovereign, and will not accept bowing down to the dictation sentiment we Syrians all share and we all want the world to know.